So welcome to today's event on negotiating peace after wars of atrocity, co-hosted with the government of Liechtenstein. The discussion today will explore the dilemmas that arise when peacemakers seem to face choices between settling an armed conflict and holding to account those responsible for severe human rights violations. Whereas in the past, perpetrators may have sought and received far-reaching amnesty, impunity is no longer acceptable due to changing legal and political norms and obligations. Ensuring accountability for past atrocities is today often widely expected by the international community and by survivors. Efforts to reckon with the past are also acknowledged as essential for sustainably building peace in the long term. Yet in the short term, delivering on justice is often complex and challenging for mediators. Negotiated settlements to armed conflict have the potential to end immediate often devastating suffering. Processes to establish accountability prior to negotiations or to include accountability mechanisms as part of political processes risk deterring those suspected of war crimes from coming to the negotiating table or from cooperating. But they can also facilitate peace processes by removing those most complicit in crimes and often most opposed to peace. Understanding how these difficult trade-offs have been navigated in the past will help inform current and future negotiations at a time when ongoing conflicts in Syria, South Sudan, and elsewhere are characterized by widespread atrocities, when there are growing threats of withdrawal from the International Criminal Court, but also when countries emerging from war are seeking ways of building peace. Before turning to today's distinguished panel to discuss how these dilemmas and trade-offs are managed, let me first invite Ambassador Christian Wenoesser, permanent representative of Liechtenstein, to make opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Thanks to IPI, and thank you everybody for coming. It's great to see such a such a full room. I'll be I'll be very brief. I really want to hear from the I really want to hear from the panel. Uh, we're very happy to uh, be able to co-host this um, today. Um, for us, this is in the middle of two events that are very important to us. One is the event yesterday. That was the discussion in the General Assembly on the accountability mechanism for Syria, which is a mechanism that we have initiated together with uh, like-minded countries. So yesterday, we had, for the first time in New York, a discussion on this. And I think that shows you a bit where we stand on the question uh, at hand. We do believe uh, very strongly that justice has to be uh, a very important, uh, indispensable part uh, of, uh, of a peace discussion, even or in particular in a situation like, uh, like Syria. Uh, the other event is the uh, upcoming high-level event on sustaining peace um, next week that will gather a lot of high-level, uh, political-level uh, people and for us is a very important opportunity to talk about many aspects of this complex question, but also about this one. Um, what is the role of justice? What is the role of accountability in order to bring sustainable peace to a society? I really believe that this is one of the most uh, complex questions um, that, we are, that we are facing. I think in, in principle there is uh, an emerging consensus that uh, justice uh, is a part of sustainable development. It has to go in hand in hand uh, with peace and security and with uh, human rights. And that, uh, that the question should not be whether there is justice, but how it's done and when it's done. Uh, important things have happened. Of course, you have alluded to them in the, in the past two decades, in particular, the uh, understanding that amnesties for the most serious crimes under international law are not permissible. Um, and is not something that is, for example, uh, supported by the UN um, system. And of course, the emergence of the International Criminal Court in particular has also been a, a paradigm shift in this respect. All of that said, um, I think the practice is far, far more uh, complex and far more complicated. And we will, we will hear about that um, from the panelists, and I really very much uh, look forward to this. This is, uh, uh, in some ways, um, a discussion of uh, clashes of, of beliefs, I think. Um, there is a lot of people that think peace is more important than justice and vice versa. 
um, reconciling the two um, is a big challenge. Um, but I think it's extremely important to not have a black and white approach to these uh, questions because that's not an approach that will uh, that will bring uh, positive um, answers. And finally, of course, uh, the Security Council discussed this morning the situation in Colombia. We will hear a, a lot about this, so this is very timely. Colombia had an extremely complex and complicated peace process, which in some ways, of course, is uh, still going on. And the question um, on the agenda today was a, was, a, was a key issue in that process as well. So thank you all for being here. Thanks to IPI, and I look forward to the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. Let me then introduce our panel. Um, first, to my right is Priscilla Hayner, member of the UN standby team of senior mediation advisors and author of the recent book, The Peacemaker's Paradox, Pursuing Justice in the Shadow of Conflict. Uh, also to my right is Teresa Whitfield, director of the Policy and Mediation Division at the UN Department of Political Affairs. To my immediate left, uh, Natalia Arboleda of the Permanent Mission of Colombia to the United Nations. And also to my left, Professor Rudy Titel, the Ernest C. Stifel Professor of Comparative Law at New York Law School. Um, each speaker will have around seven to eight minutes for remarks, after which we'll open the floor for uh, questions and comments, and then towards the end, I'd like to save time for closing remarks from the ambassador. So, um, Priscilla, let me start with you. Uh, in your book, you write about the twin imperative to stop violence on, and end impunity on one hand, um, or sorry, to stop violence on one hand and, and end impunity. And, and you note that the peace and justice equation is often fluid and that resolving this tension requires what you call a strategic and creative response. So could you say more about this tension, the different ways it's been resolved, and what lessons it suggests for mediators facing similar dilemmas? Yes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jake. Um, indeed, and as we heard in the introductory comments as well, there does seem to be a, a clash of, of beliefs of two different worldviews almost. And, and in a sense, that's why I entered into a process of trying to put my head around the question to write a book on the question in order to bring together these two worlds, the world of human rights advocacy and the importance of finding accountability for serious crimes and the very important world of stopping violence. And clearly, we can all see that there are tensions between those worlds and there needs to be some sort of conversation as well in order to bring those to a, um, some sort of resolution and get out of some of the conflicts that we're seeing around the world. I thought that perhaps I would say a few words about what we see um, when we look at these examples of peace negotiations world round. And in a sense, we've heard reference to Colombia. It's a very important reference point for all of us. Without getting into the details of that agreement, and I'm sure you all have a general sense of that, we'll be discussing that in the course of the panel, I think it does show us several important things. First, it shows us how very difficult this issue is, grappling with war crimes, grappling with the need for justice while trying to negotiate an end to war was an extremely difficult endeavor in Colombia. They spent over two years. There were many moments at which people thought it wasn't quite doable. Um, that's one. Two, in fact, it, a solution was possible. And that was possible, as you have said, through a creative and context-specific response that was neither a deal of impunity, nor was it what we might call maximalist justice that, that would not take into account the context of a transition out of war. So it was something that we haven't seen before, as is appropriate. One needs to grasp, grasp and, uh, and, and, uh, and craft a response that is specific to the to, to the conflict, to the, each conflict and con context. The third takeaway is that there were many different factors that shaped the outcome. Um, so first, certainly the the fact of the International Criminal Court engaging in Colombia and sort of serving as a role of sort of watching over and nudging and making its presence clearly felt was very important, and that did impact the outcome as we have seen also in other countries. 
Um, it wasn't just the ICC, however. Also, the national judicial system was certainly strong enough and the parameters were clear enough in Colombia that it was clear to the warring parties that they couldn't just sort of push this issue away. They had to come up with a solution and know in advance to the degree that was possible what was to happen. And the third, in terms of the solution and in terms of the factors that shaped it, was the important role of victims in the peace negotiations in Colombia. This is something that we haven't seen before to this extent. They played a central role in actually taking part in attending, representative victims attending the talks in Havana, as well as undertaking many national and regional fora discussions, um, consultations to get input. And that was very important to increase the legitimacy of the final deal. The final of the takeaways is that once agreed, and once there was a, a final peace agreement in Colombia, what we have seen in the last year, almost year and a half, is that implementation is very, very difficult. And on the issue of justice, it's an area that tends to continue to change after the signature is on the page. So it's almost as if the negotiations continue. There's different actors at the table, so to speak, in the conversation. That's a good thing. The political and power dynamics change as to who can call the shots. So unexpectedly, in Colombia and unexpectedly in many other places where we look at peace agreements, you see that, in fact, what was agreed and what everyone thought the deal would be on the justice side tends to change over time in, in the future. So in, in brief, this issue is very tough. Um, if you look at Uganda 10 years ago, uh, if you look at the West African cases, Liberia, Sierra Leone, if you look at Central America, going back further, El Salvador, Guatemala, many other examples around the world, this issue of justice is often one of the toughest in the, in the course of the talks. I wanted to turn then very briefly um, to preserve the time to the question of what, again, what the role is and what the impact is of the International Criminal Court in context of peace negotiations, an important issue to all of us who care about uh, human rights and all of us who care about ending conflict. Um, so I'd like to address two questions very briefly. One, one is what is the impact on the possibility of prevention or deterrence? And the second is what is the impact of the ICC on prospects for peace? So on the deterrence question, in brief, it's clear to me, looking at many cases around the world, that national actors, local actors, do respond to the threat of prosecution from the ICC. When they understand that, they, that the focus is on them, they, their behavior changes. That includes in not committing crimes that were threatened and making that clear. Their hands were clean, they know they're being watched, they send those signals very clearly. So there are quite a number of examples where you actually see, ah, actually deterrence in the most positive sense. The unfortunate side of this story is that that deterrence effect tends to be short term. And it also tends to have the effect only in the specific place, which is under sort of the, 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 the focus of the ICC prosecutor. So we see, unfortunately, several examples, a number of examples where people change their behavior, they clean up their act, but then when they realize they're no longer being watched, some of the old um, troubles come back. Um, so what to do about that? We need to think through. But there's both a positive and an unfortunate side of the conclusion there. The second question on the ICC is, what is, what is the impact in terms of, I mentioned the Columbia example, which was largely positive, but there were some difficult moments there in terms of how the ICC prosecutor was perceived as intervening um, in ways that were complicated and, and there was a bit of pushback, but overall positive in terms of, its, of the ICC's impact on the talks in Colombia. There is, in fact, clearly, and as our instincts would tell us, there is a, a danger that the ICC can be, or could potentially be, a spoiler to a peace process. What's good is that the ICC prosecutor is 
is certainly very aware of that. She does not intend to be a spoiler. She's very clear about that. She's written and spoken about that. She tries to take this into account increasingly when she's working in context of negotiations or potential negotiations. And in fact, there's a number of examples where she and her office have provided, in a very useful way, provided guidance, not only positive pressure for justice, but also sort of guidance as to where the parameters may lie. For example, in Colombia, in setting out in very specific terms what might be the standards on sentencing and the minimal standards and what the, what the factors might be that would allow some flexibility there, which turned out to be a central element in finding a solution. Having said that, I would certainly argue that the ICC should and can take take a much more strategic approach to its work and to take more into account even the context in which it's working when there is an ongoing conflict, which there often is in the places where the ICC is engaged, to be strategic in considering both how and when to engage and intervene. For example, if there are arrest warrants, should they be sealed or open? At what, what is the timing of coming in? Should there be a, a, a public messaging, even apart from specific uh, steps along the criminal justice side? Actually, the public messaging and threats from the prosecutor can be positive, or they can scare people off and back into the back into the bush, in a sense. So essentially, I, I argue in a word that I think it's more possible for an international prosecutor to try to calculate the impact of the court's actions before undertaking steps. You can't always see into the future, but I think there's more that could be done to have a higher likelihood not to, to, to impede the possibility of a peace agreement and to actually play an encouraging and positive role along those lines. So I know it it's, suggests what some people call too political or a political approach to justice, but I think in the context where the ICC is involved, it is a political um, context, and the ICC will have a political impact and be affected by politics. So we need to grapple with what that means. Perhaps just as a final sentence, there is allowance in the Rome Statute specifically um, for the prosecutor to take into account these factors through the signaling of considering the interests of justice, uh, which I won't go into here. But there, there's some interesting uh, leeway that's provided. So I'll leave my comments there, and thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Priscilla. Teresa, uh, let me turn to you. I mean, it would be very interesting to hear about how the UN is adjusting to the tensions between, on one hand, this overwhelming imperative to try and bring conflicts to heal, but also to uphold standards of international human rights. And if you could say maybe how the, the thinking and guidance within the UN system has begun to change and how it applies more broadly. Thank you very much, Jake, and it's very good to be here. I was thinking um, how to approach this last night partly because I know Priscilla very well, I should declare that, and we've known each other since the days of El Salvador, so it goes back to the early UN days on, on these issues, and now Priscilla works with us on the standby team, so mainly what the UN does is sends in Priscilla. When, 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 when problems of this nature come up, we put Priscilla on a plane. Um, but, but more seriously, I, it, it made thinking about what to say other, other than send in Priscilla and read her book and, and how we address it, it made me think about the evolution precisely within, within the UN of these conversations. And going back to El Salvador, I was poking around. I was a journalist in El Salvador and then, then joined the UN in the wake of the peace negotiations, but, but followed very closely the, the, the negotiations and the creation of the Truth Commission and things. And I was Googling around. I was trying to remember when, because um, I don't follow El Salvador that closely now, when the, when the amnesty law, there was a blanket amnesty law that was kept out of the negotiations kind of to the relief of the UN, so it didn't have to deal with the issue of blanket amnesty, though knew there had to be a generalized amnesty to get the fighters back in. But the UN was also conscious that it didn't really know how to handle these issues back in 1992. The amnesty law was not repealed until July 2016. And when I was looking up the date, I came across a BBC story, which I thought in a way encapsulates that this, this is a long-term issue. And what happens in negotiations, even with a kind of rocky process of implementation, has 
deep emotional consequences for the history and evolution of, of uh, countries emerging from conflicts. The BBC quote began, I've translated it rather f sort of hokily from the Spanish, that the wounds that have never healed from the bloody civil war in El Salvador have just opened up a little more, but this also means that justice may be found in 30 plus cases which have scarred the nation. So this is nearly 25 years on, you're still talking about the wounds that have scarred the nation and the extent to which um, repealing the amnesty law opens things up or makes things worse. And these debates remain very live. And the cases that it was referred to are cases which any Salvadoran know, you know, the, the, the cases of history, the names, in the same way that now the names of the cities in Syria where atrocities have been have been committed will resonate for generations down through Syrian life and identity in Colombia as well. So for my first point is this, this is just a long-term issue. Um, the second is that in, in UN terms, in, for, for, for good reasons and bad, um, the issue has got actually harder to, 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 to address. I mean, there are, I'm not pleased and uh, I'm not saying that the normative evolution that we've seen since the early 90s is not a very positive thing. It is a very positive thing, but a combination of factors, including the normative evolution and the change in the nature of conflicts, have both contributed to the issue of managing the tensions between peace and justice in negotiations for a UN or other media, but particularly, particularly for the UN, because the UN acts is a normative actor and so is bound by those norms. Um, has got harder. If we look back to those early, early post-Cold War days, you had El Salvador, Guatemala, South Africa, where the UN wasn't directly engaged, but an awful lot of issues could be kind of parked to one side. So you had San Egidio, a Catholic organi lay organization, mediating agreements to the end, end of the war in Mozambique, where horrible atrocities were committed, and it was possible to just sort of quietly, again, put them on side, get on with it. What would we have done with Pol Pot today? Luckily, we don't have to address it, but we do have to address Syria and similar kind of situations. But the agreements that the international community and the UN, very centrally involved in Cambodia, not at all possible today. We've had from, in the UN, there was, a, there was a meeting in 1998, which, which Priscilla and I were both at, um, up in Pocantico, which led to the, the, the drafting of guidance for the UN mediators, which was basically making sure that the, the war crimes, uh, war crimes and um, genocide and the three, the three core categories of crimes were that the UN couldn't sign agreements to where, where the major, major um, war crimes were, were going to get amnesties. And that guidance was kind of developed. It was led by Alvaro de Soto, who I was working for then, who'd done the El Salvador negotiations that kind of came out of this unease that we needed to be do better. Those were initial guidelines. Then you had the creation of the ICC, um, and then R2P, and developments on atrocity prevention, greater attention to kind of normative commitments on a whole range of human rights. I'd also include the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, and, and the rights elements of, of, of that. Much greater attention in our mediation work to issues of inclusion, including the, including the perspectives of, of, of victims and the need to have much broader buy-in from a community and societal level to agreements. All of those incredibly positive things, I think we'd all, we'd all agree. But if you are the UN mediator, they do not make your life any easier. Um, they, you know, this, this whole range of things that you're expected to uphold and, and deliver on. On the other side of the coin, and this is not such a good thing as those, those good normative developments, but also contributing to things harder, has been the change in the nature of the conflicts. Those early conflicts were kind of, uh, and in a way, Colombia is a bit of a mix between an old conflict and a new conflict, because the old conflicts were kind of quasi-state conflicts with formed, structured, hierarchical insurgent movements which had ideological goals, they wanted to take over the government, and, and you could negotiate with them in the same way as you could negotiate with the FARC. There was, there's an agenda that you, couldn't, you didn't have to deliver at all, but, but there was a hierarchical structure and a program that could be negotiated um, into which was put peace and justice issues. The newer kind of conflicts, and Colombia has some of that as well in terms of very fragmented armed groups and lots of other forms of violence and criminal groups and murky, constantly shifting kind of patterns of violence. Other kinds of conflict, if we look across the arc from the Sahel into the, into the Middle East, we're all very familiar with, with the nature of the conflicts there. Very fragmented and evolving armed groups, some of them um, 
related to kind of global ideologies of uh, radical extremism, regionally entwined conflicts. So the role of the states are very complicated. The role of the states in the region and neighboring and regional states who are entwined in conflict will have very strong views on issues in peace and justice as we find all over the place, um, certainly in the Middle East, certainly something which will be there in, in Syria. So that, 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 the evolution of those, those kinds of evolution, the kind of fragmentation and atomization of the kind of conflicts rather than a nice, well-structured revolutionary guerrilla group um, have, have also made it very difficult. Um, I'll say a couple, um, I think though, one of the, the other advances in Priscilla's work very, mu very much uh, reflects and the kind of case studies, her book is a mixture of sort of case studies and, and more cross-cutting discussions illustrate is that we, we do have options and we, it's on, on the mediator to help find options or to turn to those experts such as those gathered here who can help uh, come up with ideas for options. Um, we all, if you're a mediator, you have to recognize that those sitting across the table from you or with you uh, have most likely committed horrible things or been part of organizations which have done horrible things. That's why you're there. I mean, that, that, that's what the name of the game is. If you're trying to end the war, you're dealing with the people. You're hopefully dealing with lots of other people as well who are drivers and actors for peace, but you are dealing with people who have done horrible stuff and no one wants to negotiate their way into a prison into a jail cell that, that you start from there and this is the, the thing that um, I'm sure we'll hear from Natalia Colombia was dealing with from the very beginning but there are different kind of things to be done there's timing there's there's mechanisms there's a mi mixed mixture of national and international mechanisms there's uh, in some cases there's there's the the playing a little bit or, or working or having a sense of what the ICC may do there's a relationship between high level cases and broader justice processes uh, um, reparations, truth commissions, a range of things can be done. Finally, and I've been handed a one-minute card, I would say that even though that there are a range of, of technical and legal and ad hoc and a range of options that can be put forward, one of the things, and I think this goes back to my, my sort of starting point on El Salvador, one of the things that I increasingly think we have to recognize, and it's very difficult for the UN as, as other actors, but perhaps particularly hard for the UN, is the, the 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 sort of the emotional and intangible aspect of of this? What constitutes justice? What constitutes justice in the eyes of a population that that has suffered horrible human rights abuses? Why is it that one or two individuals can can kind of electrify a state with what happens to them? How do people perceive their past? What's the memory? They will never, probably never agree on a common narrative of the conflict because that's what the conflict is rooted in. And how does, how does a mediator, when approaching issues of peace and justice, factor in these sort of intangible issues of emotion, memory, perception, and grievance? And how does that relate to the broader peace and justice question? Okay, stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Teresa. Natalia, there's been a lot of reference to Colombia, and I mean the question of how to resolve the, the justice issue, issue in, in Colombia was one of the most contentious aspects of, of the talks. And I mean, picking up on on your phrase, I mean, it it, it, it was a, a very creative solution. It was also a process that really put victims very much at the at the center of, of the process. So I think it'd be, it'd be great to hear about your personal experience in, in the negotiations. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Natalia Arbolea from the Mission of Colombia. I was previously involved with the Havana talks. I was part of the government delegation. Um, I was traveling to Havana for over a year, a year and a half. Um, and well, I'm very honored to be here with Priscilla. Uh, her book on Truth Commission actually was one of the, our main guides on the negotiation on Truth Commission. And of course, Teresa for her support uh, and the UN support. And with you. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened during the negotiation uh, and why this, precisely this peace versus justice um, dilemma was so hard um, during those five years in Havana. Uh, I want to give you a little context. I'm pretty sure that everyone here, we've been talking about the Colombian peace process for a long time, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone uh, here is familiar with the process. But just to give you a context, um, well, 
we had one of the longest uh, internal armed conflicts of the hemisphere for over 50 years. We um, had the rise of leftist, leftist guerrillas in the 60s, and we had previous attempts of negotiations. With some of these guerrillas, we were successful, but under another international context, and this is very important because uh, for example, 89, 1991, we had a previous negotiation with guerrillas like uh, M19, and we we negotiating we negotiated without the ICC, without the, the the current developments of international law. So what happened is that we had a, an amnesty, a blank amnesty, and that was it. Now dealing with FARC. Um, that we had tried to negotiate for five uh, previous attempts at least. Um, this time we tried to do things differently. What was that made this process different and unique and actually successful? And I do the quotes because signing the peace is just the first step to the peace building era and we are gonna be 15 to 50 years um, trying to come to become the peaceful society we wanna be. But what made this process di different? Um, the main thing is that we negotiated over a limited agenda. Um, a previous, the most recent proce previous process that failed, that was the Kawan process, was an agenda of over 100 uh, issues. And in Havana, we had five issues. Uh, and that's, well, five, five main issues and one um, uh, implementation uh, point. Um, and I want to I want to make a, a, a reference here because when we were negotiating the limited agenda that was negotiated in 2012, and when the government said victims have to be in the center of this process, the most important thing about this process is to re redress victims' rights. Um, we were dealing with FARC with a different mentality. We were dealing with a FARC of the 60s. We were dealing with a FARC thinking that an amnesty was po a complete amnesty was possible. Um, and that's why when you look at this agenda, when it says victims' rights, you never see the word justice. You see the words human rights, uh, victims' uh, human rights, and you see the word truth, but you don't see the word justice. And this was because at the beginning of the process, they had a completely different mentality. Um, the process began, we negotiated the three, uh, uh, um, three of the of the points that was a rural rural reform, political participation, and um, the problem with illicit crops. When we got to the victims' um, point of the agenda, we were stopped. Um, the previous points were negotiated in approximately six, five to six months. Um, this one was the longest one and the hardest one and where we had to appeal to many different actors to help us overcome our um, obstacles. Why we were stuck? Because the government arrived to the table and we were clear that we were gonna uh, pursue, we were gonna um, um, complete, I forgot. Meet. Meet. The, the international standards, the international standards and the international law. Um, so we were saying there's no amnesty for uh, the most serious crimes. We're going to negotiate this under the Rome Statute, and um, there's going to th there has to be some kind of sac sanction. At the beginning, we were saying we we were proposing something. Um, well, jail, uh, some kind of of, of 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 sanction that resembles jail. And of course, Farc said, there's no, in, in history of, of guerrillas, there's no one single guerrilla that has laid down the weapons to go to jail. That goes completely against their, um, their fight and their, their, their mentality. So it was very difficult for us to reach agreements. What were, we think, the two main turning points or two of, of, of the most uh, important thing that happened that let us advance. One, and I think Priscilla mentioned this, was the direct participation of victims in the table of negotiation. 
um, in 2014, with the support of the UN and the um, Catholic Church, we managed to take 60 victims of conflict to the, the, um, to the negotiation table. And this, and I'm sorry, what, when I was talking about the context, of course, we, the complexity of our conflict um, is, of course, there's a, some leftist, leftist guerrillas, but then a paramilitary phenomenon that arise in the 80s and the 90s. And then, of course, the fuel of the narco, narco traffic that, that finances um, all illegal groups. Um, so one of the main concerns of FARC when we decided to take victims to the table was not do not bring only victims, FARC victims. This is a conflict. And if we're going to reach a solution for the victims, we have to see the complexity of the conflict, and we have to acknowledge that there are victims from all parties to conflict. But what, why do I mention this? And this is, uh, and I'm being a case study and wanting to share like small details that I think I actually changed their point of view. The the victims visit to the table were very emotional, very, very, very touching. And actually, you see these men, because the government had, as you know, two generals, one military general and one police general, um, retired generals in the negotiation table. And while well, these FARC um, negotiators, these are men that are, are used to war. And you see them really touched by victims, telling them their story, their sufferings, um, and I think it's a very human thing to, to I, I, it's a very human thing, but it actually changed and uh, made them, made them want to acknowledge their responsibility. It was a turning point. And the other one was actually, and I think Priscilla, you, you participated in some of, of, of these uh, things we did with Norway, um, trying to bring experts to talk to FARC and say, say not, not the government saying, look, this is not possible, but international experts, um, not bias experts, saying this is not possible. You're not going to be able to have a uh, an agreement where you don't comply international law standards. You have to do it this way. Those were the turning points. Of course, in a negotiation, you never get what you want. We didn't, we didn't as a government, got exactly what we wanted, but I think that the, co the comprehens comprehensive integral, um, the comprehensive um, system, truth, reparation, and justice system um, was a creative way to solve this uh, issue. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, About one minute. OK. <laughs> um, but uh, what happened um, after? we reached the agreement. And it's as you know, we lost the referendum. And I bring this point because before we were talking about this, this concept that you mentioned about shared responsibility and how it impacted on transitional justice. And I think that losing the referendum made us go a step behind because it, it, the, the transitional justice wasn't born with all the legitimacy that we wanted for it to work. So now we're struggling with uh, making of the agreement and of the judicial and non-judicial mechanisms that were agreed to make them believable and, and make them, um, of course, uh, they, they have to work, but to, 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 may, to make Colombians believe in these mechanisms, because if Colombians don't believe in the, these mechanisms. They they are not going to be able to do what they are set up to do, and it's uh, be account, uh, accountability for for the the things that happened uh, during conflict. And I think I started talk, talking about all these things, so I'll stop there, and we can continue with questions. Great. Thank you, Natalia, Professor Title. I mean, you have written on a, a variety of issues related to this, from uh, political transitions, transitional justice and human rights, including a lot of the difficult choices faced in design on whether uh, 
one should have criminal trials versus amnesties versus truth commissions, whether there should be domestic processes or international processes, um, different forms of reconciliation versus accountability. So, I mean, what what is your take on on how to reconcile the tensions between peace and justice? Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jake. And it's been uh, great to hear the exchange, particularly from folks working on this on the ground. And as you mentioned, uh, there's a period of time we've all been following these issues. I just wanted to um, maybe pick up on the question of the way the meaning of justice has evolved and, and the issues of timing and context, which I think all of the speakers have alluded to. And so for scholars who are following this, you know, you think back to the post-World War II period, uh, which, uh, you know, Nuremberg, and that was, you know, an easy case because you had the war finished, right? You have uh, the, the, the peace secured, and of course the flaw there is victor's justice, right? The view that it's victor's justice, but we, re, you know, recall uh, Nuremberg uh, because of the normativity that, it, that we've gotten, the legacy of both the uh, crime of aggression, uh, the, the in, interstate, international uh, uh, border crossing, but also crimes against humanity and the importance there that's flagged early on about the importance of adjudicating uh, in individuals for those crimes. And then fast forward, then the next time period that one thinks of is post-Cold War and how is the uh, issue of justice and timing and context, uh, how, how has that evolved? And there, you know, is where I came into the, these debates, which is uh, having been born in Argentina and following the debates about the junta there. And, you know, we were using the term punishment and impunity. I was invited to a debate at the Council on Foreign Relations after I graduated law school and you know it's like okay do do does Argentina uh, Uruguay and Chile do they have to have trials in order to have democracies and for the most part they didn't Argentina had some right the leading uh, the commanders um, but there were military stresses and the issue of stability in many of these countries immediately after uh, uh, resulted in, in, in difficult trade-offs. And so that's why I want to flag the importance of timing. And in fact, in my first book, I wrote about them as democracies amnesties, which was that there was a higher correlation with amnesties in many of the places that had succeeded military juntas than, uh, than uh, trials. Now, he here's where we get the importance of context and timing. And so, you know, obviously the situation now in Argentina in the last 10 years, they've gone back to trials and these issues of justice have not gone away. And it was very significant that we are looking at these issues of justice over a number of generations in, in Latin America. So that, uh, you know, uh, is an interesting factor here. The other is um, the local, the importance of local deliberations. And many of us who were following Latin America also, you know, uh, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission also brought together this issue of peace and justice in an interesting way because the idea was that justice was, you know, the amnesties were, for full disclosure were necessary to the peace. So that was a different equation was, you know, that idea that some modification or reinterpretation of what is justice would be necessary for promotion of the peace. And, um, and that's been a very appealing uh, example for many. Um, uh, and so we saw that uh, happening in the mid 90s. And then the other is the ICTY, where the relationship of peace and justice is again interrogated, and um, and uh, Pro Chief Prosecutor Goldstone talked about the importance of of the justice in order to promote peace, and that it was extremely important to to in particular adjudicate ethnic cleansing because you had to you know break the 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 connection between the individual acts and the group. So now we have, we are in a position of evaluating these experiments, right? The ICTY, half, you know, quarter of a century on, and um, one of the uh, themes here is the relevance of the context, the local versus international, and um, and I see those as as extremely important. So, you know, if you think about. Latin America today and, and a, a number of places in Africa, South Africa, there's a, a reconsideration and another deliberation about the meaning of justice. So it was one thing and there are issues of sequencing immediately after the conflict and, and Priscilla has already alluded to this and so has uh, Ther Teresa, that the idea is that the, there isn't a static meaning and so there is a revisiting um, even in South Africa of, about these issues. Now the third phase which has already been uh, alluded to is is the ICC and the question of what about ha the fact of a permanent international institution and how will it interact with 
and hopefully construct constructively engage with the local. And here, I think the important principle of complementarity is really the guiding, uh, the guiding principle. And we saw with respect to both in Colombia and in the um, evaluations by the ICC in thinking about its level of engagement in, in uh, Colombia, the importance of interpretation that both uh, the domestic constitutional courts in Colombia and the ICC um, uh, gave a, a greenish yellow, you know, I would say a fairly green light, a little bit of yellow, but in the early, <laughs> early days for the way the, the peace process was, was being discussed and the meaning of justice there. And, and um, if you look back to the constitutional court opinion, and in Colombia, it's very sophisticated interpret, you know, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, they evaluate the uh, the um, proposal as um, very very uh, as me meeting the standards of equal protection under the Constitution. That it's extremely important that those who are most responsible for uh, uh, these grave crimes would have some um, would be brought to justice. As far as the sanctions that have been mentioned, the ICC statute is fairly silent on any minimal uh, sanctions. And in fact, from my work from the very early days in, tran uh, in transitional justice, if you go back to post-war Germany, go back uh, to, e to evaluate Europe, um, there are minimal sanctions that are, that are uh, paid and most people were let, let out of jail after five years. Um, so there is, the issue is really about investigation and condemnation of the crimes, and then the, you know there was uh, a uh, um, an agreement that uh, you could have some creativity on the issue of sanctions. But I think just to uh, wrap up, um, you know these are examples I think of the of ongoing interpretation of the meaning of justice. This doesn't have a static meaning. It has a lot to do with local cultures, with the the political context at the time, and the cautionary note for the international community is how do we you know, productively engage. I think the normativity is out there, but that there isn't stable uh, peace that's one when, it's, when a, a, a justice process is seen as imposed from the outside. And we've seen many examples of this. So let, let me end it there, and we'll ha have time for discussion. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Let me now open up the floor to questions or comments. I would ask that uh, you keep your interventions brief, and if you could please introduce yourself, and we'll, we'll take a group of, of questions. Um, please, I have one in the middle here, and then uh, two in the back. I'm Roy Licklider from Rutgers. Two quick questions. One is, you've talked about victims, but it sounds like you're talking about just the victims of rebels. And we know that, in fact, most of the killing in these, places, these situations is done by the government. So what's the role of government victims? And are you in victims of government policy? And are, in fact, government officials on trial on the, in the same way that rebels are? Um, secondly, with the Argentinian case, it seems to me, is very troubling. Because basically what you're doing is breaking the agreements you set up to end the war. And that sends a very clear signal to everybody else saying, you can't do this. You cannot count on the, on the agreements that you're signing to hold you harmless. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask about, oh, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, my name is Joshua Sorkin. Um, and uh, so the 21st century has seen the rise of a lot of decentralized uh, networks of uh, perpetration of terror uh, and sort of so statecraft without necessarily one central uh, hierarchical leadership. I'm thinking about like ISIS, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, that kind of thing. Um, how do we determine who to hold accountable for atrocity if you're dealing with an organized uh, production of violence but done by a, a more cellular network where there is no uh, where it is more of, a, I guess, an anarchist approach to violence uh, rather than one where there's a hierarchical approach to it, despite the presence of organization. Thank you. I'm Hugh Dugan with Seton Hall University. Uh, could you please uh, describe your, the prospects for the creation of future international criminal tribunals? All right, great. Why don't we come back to the, the panel uh, on those three, and, and we can go in the order of speakers. So, Priscilla, do you want to go first? Um, 
Thank you very much. I'll be brief because I know others on the panel will address many of the questions. But but certainly on the on the first question, um, and and uh, and it is important to clarify that there was both an involvement of victims of both sides of the conflict, very much so in terms of the um, delegations that went to Havana, um, and and secondly, certainly the accountability regime or uh, uh, package that has been agreed applies to all persons who were taking part in the conflict. So in fact, of course, the rebels, state um, actors in terms of the armed forces, um, political actors or civilians that uh, would have been involved, but also, and this is where there's been some, some changing since the uh, the agreement was first signed, but also the idea was that economic actors would equally be put through this uh, new uh, tribunal for peace, the National Tribunal for Peace. Um, that has shifted somewhat as it's gone through Parliament in Colombia. So not all of those are obliged to take part. It's more voluntary for especially the civilian economic actors, for example. But the idea, and certainly it was an insistence on the part of the FARC in Colombia that all um, parties and all uh, actors who funded or took direct part in the conflict would go through uh, the same accountability regime. And that was actually one of the things that made the discussions quite difficult. And that's true also in other contexts, that it's not one-sided, but in fact um, very much uh, intended to and, and, and should reach all parties. Um, perhaps the, the question I will also address is in terms of when there's decentralized leadership, um, how do we think about accountability? And this is tricky also because I've heard some truth commissions grapple this when they're trying to identify for those truth commissions that do identify, well, who might be responsible based on the patterns before them and what might they recommend if they're going to recommend prosecutions. And in fact, the command structure is usually much more clear on the government side generally than on the rebel side. Although Usually one has a general sense of the command structure, but in terms of who was where exactly is probably less clearly documented on the armed opposition side of any conflict. So I've heard this exact question raised. It's not just a matter of the, of the structure, but also sort of the records. How does one follow command responsibility or the chain of command to, um, to, to develop accountability approaches that go beyond the foot soldiers that may have been actually present and carrying out an act. And this is, this is where we start again looking at the linkages between, I think was rightly mentioned by others, the non-criminal justice approaches such as truth commissions, other investigations that sometimes lead into or have a sort of a sister relationship with the criminal justice mechanisms and are increasingly seen as quite important both for victims and acknowledgement and, and engaging many, many more people in the process, but also trying to identify, well, what, what then should happen next? You can't just allow this to be to, to fall to judges to have to resolve thousands and thousands and thousands of cases on their own. It's much more helpful to, to also have non-judicial um, assistance in trying to work out, and part of it is exactly working out the kinds of questions you've put. So I'll leave my comments perhaps to those, those two questions. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, come in on the second one, um, which, I mean, also relates to my point about the, the challenges of, of negotiating with groups that are fragmented and don't have hierarchies, or, or in the case of the FARC, there was a nine-man secretariat and kind of Leninist structures of discipline, so it, which greatly facilitates um, issues of accountability to some extent and, um, and negotiating. Uh, one as aspect that I didn't mentioned that I think is going to be very much part of the new framework in any, and if we look forward, say, five years, and we're looking at a kind of, maybe optimistically looking at a kind of post-conflict terrain in some of the big countries and conflicts in the Middle East, um, you know, Syria, Yemen, Libya, I, I hope we're looking there, is the role of social media and the kind of, um, and, and the kind of enormous amount of information, really quite different from some of the earlier conflicts, that the enormous amount of information that's out there and the archives that have been kept on the, I mean, you know, there are various different atrocity um, 
mechani mechanisms looking at looking at Syria now, and there's all the issues of access that that that, that we're very familiar about with. But I do think when at some point the extent of knowledge and the ability to document stuff that that is out there is going to play a big role in discussions about accountability. Of course, it won't get over the 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 higher level questions um, about the politics of accountability and the politics of accountability in whatever that future regional context looks like. But I think it's something to put, put, put in there. There'll be, there'll be a lot of questions about the legitimacy of that information and who can validate it. And I think in, there are a number of cases where the, the, UN's, the UN's capacity to do public reporting on human rights has been extremely useful, including politically useful for conflict prevention and even for resolution. And there are a number of missions We've done studies with OHHR on the public, the sort of positive impacts of public reporting of human rights in a number of places. But of course, there are huge limitations in terms of where the UN is able to do credible reporting of public human rights. Um, so just to say that I think, think there are, we are going to come into a whole sort of next generation of issues around accountability that are related to communications technology and documentation. Thanks. Natalia. Well, although Priscilla already clarified, um, just to say something uh, further on that regard, and is that the mechanisms of the comprehensive system, the special jurisdiction, the truth commission, and the unit for m the search of, of the missing, um, they all, and the reparations um, systems and measures, they all aim to redressing victims from conflict um, either if they are victims of FARC, if they are victims of state agents, or uh, and also if they are victims of the paramilitaries who also uh, were parties um, to, to conflict. And just to make a quick observation, because what Priscilla mentioned regarding um, uh, what, what, what happened during the Congress approbation of um, the constitutional amendment that was made in order to implement the, the agreement and the comprehensive system, and then the ruling by the Constitutional Court. Actually, what we agreed was that um, everyone that was involved w could be called by the special jurisdiction. I'm, I'm making making it more, more simple that, than what it really is. But that's part of the changes that the agreement has suffered during all these steps that have to um, to be undertaken in order to implement the agreement. And that's why I, I do believe that we we still in some way negotiating because we we, we still change we are still suffering changes of, of what was agreed. So just uh, on the Argentina and on the corporate liability question. So on Argentina, I think it's very interesting, but it's really the de developments of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is another regional actor that we haven't talked about. Uh, there were you know, steady decades of rulings, and there have been a, you know, victims hitting the road and victims really making their voices heard. So we get this se second phase in, in Argentina, and now it, they come back not as prosecutions uh, uh, you know, in name, but as human rights trials, and it's really something that is there. It's, it's being said it's for the victims. And normatively, um, the Inter-American Court is saying that these are rights under the American Convention. So that is a development that the Argentine second phase um, you know, responded to. You have the Simon case. You have a reopening of uh, some of the uh, pardons and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, the, uh, I would agree that where it becomes politicized, there, you know, that part I would say is still very much in keeping with rule of law, but it's politicized if it's selective and you have to have you know, the regular principles of, uh, of uh, domestic law and so forth, I even in, in these settings. So that's something to watch out for and something that Argentine scholars and, and uh, critics and pundits have, have, um, have responded to and now we have a change of government, the Macri government. It's a different set of, of priorities than the Kirshner government. On the, on the point of corporate liability and the, and the networks, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, it's one that has bedeviled, um, I think, prosecution of systemic crimes. These are crimes that often involve systematicity. Uh, and even if one tries to focus on an individual here and there, they're often systemic and policy elements. Um, I would flag two uh, places where uh, corporate liability 
liability. There, you know, there's doctrine and there's case law. Argentina has significant cases in corporate liability in, uh, under the recent uh, um, prosecutions uh, of the of, under the Kirchner government of various companies like Ford. Ford was the symbol of the of the of the detentions, people being shoved into a Ford, and they and they there were leaders of the company that have been brought to justice and many other places because people were disappeared at their workplace and uh, the you know various uh, uh, group meetings the in the US the alien tort claims act is a place where people have sought corporate liability uh, you know and there there are a number of cases where uh, companies have been held to account for human rights violations that were committed abroad but they were held to account in the southern district in in uh, in New York so it's an ongoing question and it's something that I know that even in the debates over the ICC, there were questions of moving beyond just the whole focus on natural persons and so on. And so I, I expect that in the future, there will be more and more uh, attention being placed on the question of corporate accountability. Just to uh, end, uh, American Society of International Law, I participated in a panel about a week ago on that topic Saturday morning. So I'm sure there's a webcast and you can get more information from uh, the panel uh, about that. Uh, so yeah. Great. Let me come back to the floor. I have uh, one question here, then here, and, and then in the back, and several others. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David donat Katen with the Parliamentarians of Global Action, also teach international at NYU Center for Global Affairs. Uh, I'm very happy that the issue of prevention was put on the table because it's really peace and justice. When we have seen injustice, we are not seeing peace. Just let me mention Resolution 1970 and the way, unfortunately, Colonel Gaddafi got slaughtered in cold blood when he had already surrendered to the rebels, and nobody had told the rebels that this was a man wanted by the ICC for crimes against humanity. He was a fugitive from justice. So this type of um, uh, opposite of justice, these summary executions and violations of the human rights of those who should be brought to justice are conducive to societies like Libya today, in which the rule of law is, is not prevailing, in which there is no stabilization, in which there is no peace. And we have many other of these examples. So these complications on the table of peace negotiators are welcome in the fact that this is not only the normative framework, but it's the right normative framework because we want to prevent. And if there is no consequences for those who commit crimes against humanity today, tomorrow, then after tomorrow there will be other ones who will use crimes against humanity to acquire and maintain power. And that's where the ICC has problems. Because in Darfur, uh, Sudan, there is a victor and a loser, and that victor doesn't want to, of course, uh, uh, put himself before justice, as, as indicted for genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. We have seen the Libyan situation, how it has been dealt with. And we are seeing also other situations in which, unfortunately, maybe there is not yet an armed conflict. The ICC has announced it, it's doing preliminary examinations. But you have an Edo state who compared himself to Adolf Hitler and said, if he, he killed 6 million Jews, I'll be happy to kill uh, 3 million drug addicts. So we have a very uh, important role to play for the prevention of mass atrocities and conflict and stability. So it's all together, and I think I wanted to, to make the point that it's not only normatively complicated, it's what is right. Now, a question on penalties. Uh, it's correct, like Professor Teitel said, there is no minimum penalty in the Rome Statute for genocide. So you can even be sentenced to one day of jail or, or no imprisonment. In theory, it's not against the statute. Now, once penalty that is not there, but we have seen consistently working with mem members of parliament as something absolutely necessary for peace and justice, is removal from office, ineligib ineligibility to public office, uh, the absolute need from those in government, and I underline here, in government and in the rebellion, to be removed from power. Because most of the time they fight for power and greed, not, not for great uh, ideological uh, designs. In most cases, including the leader of ISIS and so on, they put forward an ideological design and then they have that type of uh, agenda. We have seen it in conflicts like the Central African Republic or the Congo that are based on really greedy motivation of exploiting uh, territorial and natural resources. So my point is, why don't we formalize more a practice on this? That one of the essential sanctions, apart from jail term, is removal from us office ineligibility, as in corruption and transnational organized crime treaties, that this becomes really a, 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 a standard practice for all these type of uh, negotiations. Thank you. 
My name is Sally Kader, and I represent International Federation for Peace and Sustainable Development. Thank you all for all the information. I was in, in Colombia last February. I was invited to the Nobel Peace Laureate Summit. And President Santos was amazing, as he has done so much to bring about the peace in Colombia. The people were just, you know, cannot, they're beyond themselves because they're having peace, they're rebuilding, they're doing a lot of great things. And uh, the Opera House, and you know, we were, we had a great time. It's very important to have a president that is willing and want to, as Santos did. But in the other countries, how do we go about it? Like you have Syria now. How do you negotiate? With whom do you negotiate? What do you do about it? You have Yemen, you have, uh, of course, Libya. There is no one. How do we go about it? It's still going on and on and on. But there is some way that we have to break through and start talking with people. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Uh, Hillary, someone online? I'm sorry. Hi, thank you. Uh, there's been quite a bit of engagement online. Um, firstly, from um, Srey Volik and Muzamil Magbul on Facebook, they would like to know if you have any insights uh, relevant to the Kashmir issue as well as uh, upcoming elections in Cambodia. And then from Twitter, uh, Jonathan Rosen from CPJ wanted to ask Teresa Whitfield, uh, what is the role of journalists and the press for contributing to peace negotiations and justice after wars of atrocity? Yes. And then there was just one more here. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard Gordon, former UN staff member. The Central African Republic seems to display extremely complex, difficult, and even intractable situation these days. Not only is civil society broken down, but there is political and religious polarization, difficulties in the capital. They seem to be partially pacified, moved to the countryside. There's external military forces. And it seems to be a very static situation. I wonder if anybody in the panel knows what will happen next. Is there any hope for some negotiations that could be even partially fruitful? Because uh, the Central African Republic appears in the paper as a very desolate and dismal situation without much positive uh, approaches being presented these days. Thank you. And then. The, the actual the question I had intended to take, sorry, was uh, just here in, in black and orange, please. Thank you. I'd like to remember the process in Chile, which Ms. Titel has alluded to. After the military in Chile abandoned power, more or less, in 1990, there was a process of justice, which was quite complex in itself, all the more so since Pinochet's regime had adopted an amnesty law before, of course, leaving power. Reconciliation, I think, and there was a peace and, and re reconciliation mission, commission. Well, at least one person there, the spokesman, was, even though he had been a, a lawyer for human rights since a few months after the coup in 1973, he was all for reconciliation and leaving behind a bit the justice part of the whole thing. On the other hand, uh, it's been a very long time since then, about 27, 28 years, and still the justice process continues. The reconciliation, I would say, not really. They are still, for example, this just to illustrate it, I'm not against it at all. There have been memorial services at secret detention places that were secret detention places, of course, and that attitude is not reconciliation. It's more like never again referring, of course, to violations of, of human rights. So how do you actually see that uh, relation between reconciliation and justice? Great, thanks very much. Let me come back to the panel then, and I think we'll go in reverse order. So, uh, Ruti, if you could start, please. Okay, just on the, on the last, uh, I'll just quickly, uh, on Chile, you know, I think it's an example of postponed, of very much justice deferred, 
There was, a, as you said, a, t a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it precedes the South African one. It doesn't get the credit that the South African uh, one does, but it was a remarkable job and a lot of reparations and group you know, health and so forth provided for. So it, it really did play a role um, uh, uh, in informing many other subsequent uh, uh, endeavors. But I think it shows how long these issues take to work out. And if you think about the fact that in Europe, people are still arguing about how much you can say about you know the genocide that happened there and, and, and you know recent trials of the Khmer Rouge, I think the passage of time um, to, is, is paradoxical here because when you talk about state crimes, it's not speedy justice really that we see, but rather uh, you have to have dis, you know disqualify, change the institutions, uh, find uh, the, the evidence. There's really uh, you know it often takes decades before you can really have a rule of law. Uh, uh, in the way of criminal justice. Um, on the other, there were a couple of mentions of, of badly done uh, uh, transitional justice, of you know, Gaddafi, Hussein. I would add uh, quite a number uh, to that list. And I, and I think there's the, there's the danger that if these trials, if trials are not, don't follow due process, if there aren't the kind of protections that we associate with, with justice, well, then it's nothing like that. This, this is just would be an abrogation, right? And it would, and, and it, and this message would be a misfire. It wouldn't be one of rule of law. And you know, if you think back to uh, the the justice after you know communism in Romania and so on, there are many examples, right, which we can think of. So just having a trial, um, if it, if it doesn't follow due process, won't won't do it. Um, people mentioned uh, disqualifications. Illustration. This is what was a big approach in Eastern Europe after the end of communism. I, I, I know you were focusing on the exclusion element, to exclude people from political power, but I want to focus on the inclusion. And I think that Colombia is doing a very good job of emphasizing that, because what we see that can really add to instability over time is, is exclusion of relevant actors uh, down the road. So that all can be accomplished under this question of administrative justice, about disqualifications and qualifications. And certainly you don't want someone running the Human Rights Bureau that engaged in human rights violations. But those are at the extremes. And most people, you know, when people were looking this after communism, you know, you had someone who didn't commit human rights violations. They were reformable. I met people who were judges under the communists and then were judges under in the subsequent period and even professors. So most people uh, uh, didn't commit those extreme uh, crimes. Uh, let me just, uh, in the interest of time, this question about journalism and about Syria, let me come Combine that, and I think that what we're seeing is a lot of work being done on documentation, the accountability mechanism. There are several uh, such uh, projects, and uh, and that's something certainly that uh, journalists and other and lawyers and others, uh, civil society are doing. And until the timing is right, we've been talking about timing. Uh, that is something very important, and certainly the media can also keep uh, these issues alive and very present for us, uh, you know, politically. Well, I'm sorry to talk about my country all the time, but that's my role in this panel. So um, <laughs> actually, um, and Rudy mentioned it, um, the, the, the issue of removing from power is like the country, um, what we did with the, uh, the process was uh, to give a political um, and to include in the political arena, in the democracy, widen the democracy, um, some actors that were left out before, uh, and that was the whole idea of the process. And that's why the issue of political participation was so important. And I think to come with international standards on sanction, sanctions as removing from power, it's, it's very um, problematic as um, conflicts respond to different causes and to do, uh, they have different complexities. Um, so I think uh, is problematic, and the main example is what well, what we did with the political participation inclusion. Um, and just a quick observation on what was being said regarding reconciliation. We fought a lot with words like forgiveness, for example, wh while we were negotiating um, being a Catholic country, uh, and we fought a lot with forgiveness and reconciliation concepts um, because we, we, we couldn't fully 
um, agreed on the meaning of those words. That's why, for example, when we talk about our Truth Commission, we didn't talk about Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we talk about Truth and Coexistence and Non-Repetition Commission. Um, I think reconciliation, and this is my very personal view, reconciliation and forgiveness are very personal for the victims, process for the victims to go um, to to go through. And what we have to do is to set some conditions that ensure that everyone in the society can go, um, to, can undertake those paths towards uh, coexistence and peaceful societies. But it's just a brief observation. Teresa. Thank you. Um, I wanted just to reiterate that I've I think the normative developments in the last two decades are in, in an incredibly positive thing. I was never saying that they're not, that they're complicated to deliver on is a different question than how positive they are. And the fact that the UN as an organization is normative in, an or in its origins and, and committed and embodies the global values we all try to live up to is one of the things that makes it, it, it kind of uh, a privilege to work for and counter counteract some of the other, other issues about working with the UN, but we won't go there. Uh, so normative framework's an incredibly good thing. I'm grateful for the, the, the reference to prevention, because of course, and at this point where we're thinking about sustaining peace, and, and I, I think a very welcome conceptual shift, which in my view we sometimes overcomplicate towards sustaining peace, which really just means that um, all through the, the long processes, and we've been talking about processes and conflicts that go back 30 years in some cases or more, that, that we need to be, we are, what we are working for is the prevention of the recurrence of violence or the prevention of the worsening, worsening of violence and getting the balance of peace and justice right is entirely because we're looking towards a sustainable and just peace that prevents the outbreak of conflict in the future. So you can't, you can't un, unravel it or unwrap it. And this particular issue is, is germane to, to the, our goals in terms of sustaining peace. Um, and the question particularly directed to me, which Ruti partly answered, absolutely, the journal, I've, I see, and particularly when we think of the challenges that a lot of us, the challenges that the UN has in access to a variety of different places, um, and the challenges we all have in knowledge, and particularly in uh, ar around, around knowledge at the moment, and the whole kind of fake news phenomenon and social media effervescence of information, means uh, in in I and mean, maybe this is because I'm a former journalist but it for me it puts like more and more onus on the importance of really rigorous first-rate journalism to help us understand what's happening and to put pressure on those of us who are on the inside of big international organizations to to know what's happening and to try and find ways to do something about it thank you very much um, terrific questions so um, Perhaps I'll start with with Libya, um, which was mentioned. And in fact, you know, it's one of the cases I look at in the book, um, not because it's in, because it's a case of peace negotiations, although there were certainly lots of attempts to negotiate um, in 2011, none of them fruitful, unfortunately. Um, but be, but the question of the impact of the ICC and sort of how that really played out. And luckily, I was able to go. Um, in 2011, 12, 13, a few times, and speak with people who were quite close um, to what was happening on both sides. And what was interesting, just to sort of respond to one point that, that you made in the first question, what was interesting is that the, the rebels actually were very aware of the ICC factor, and in fact, were strongly encouraging of the, the development of an arrest warrant for Gaddafi and others, knowing um, that it would change the political calculus all around, including from the international community. Once somebody is, is, there's an arrest warrant, there's an indictment for them for international crimes by an international court, that changes sort of the role that he is perceived as potentially playing in the future. So there was actually an active strategy to support that and provide information and such, which is completely appropriate, but very interesting to see how very self-conscious and intentional that was. At the same time, those very same people who were intentionally trying to engage the ICC in that way said in the same breath, but we don't want him to be tried by the ICC because they would much prefer the trials to take place at the national level. But it's very interesting when you explore, well, well why do you want an arrest warrant? And then you don't actually want him to be shipped off to The Hague for a trial because they could 
envision there may be possibilities that where they wouldn't have access to try him if the country had split into two, um, for various other things. There were, there were certain crimes that didn't fit under the ICC jurisdiction, of course, because it took place prior to the ICC jurisdiction. So there's a number of very logical reasons why they much prefer the trial at home. At the same time, they realized that it's quite helpful, not only politically, but potentially legally in the future, to have the ICC engaged. So when you look at how these things are thought through by local actors in real time, it becomes very, very interesting. People are usually quite smart about what they're doing, what the options are, um, not always exactly what the solutions are to get out of these difficult fixes, but but in that just to, 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 to provide that anecdote because it, it shows how sort of complex some of these sort of calculations are. Um, I also wanted to address um, the question of the Central African Republic, which was mentioned in a question as to sort of where to from here. I don't know the answer as to where to from here, but I think we can start already see, we can start to see the difficulties that the Central African Republic will present on this uh, issue of justice. The ICC has jurisdiction as an, and is, is looking very closely at, in investigating cases. Uh, there's also a special criminal court um, in CAR, which will be looking at cases as well. So these are sort of complementary, but to independent bodies. Um, at the same time, the main issue on the table from the many rebel groups, about 14 rebel groups in, in CAR, is that they actually would like amnesty, please. And the main position in response from the government and from the UN is actually, you, you know, amnesty is not on the table and won't be for serious crimes. So you have the potential to, to unfortunately block even the beginning of serious talks, which is not helpful to anyone. And there is a real priority to try to stop the real quite bad violence that has taken place and is continuing to take place in various parts of the country. I think there may be a possibility, and I was in I was in Bangui last year looking into some of these questions with folks, there may be a possibility to structure an approach to justice that supports a peace process and structure approach to a peace process that supports justice. How that plays out, I think we really need to look at carefully, but one can imagine different ways of approaching it that could be quite helpful um, to stop the violence, to stop the victimization of so many of the communities, but certainly not to give up on the need for, for accountability. Um, and there are so many issues put on the table. Perhaps as a final comment, Syria is so important, and I'm glad it's been mentioned several times. It's not a question, as was put in your, in your, in your comment, that it's not in Syria and the other um, places that you mentioned, it's not that there's no one to negotiate. I mean, there may not be a prominent one person such as Santos, as you mentioned, but there are um, key leaders or a key leader in, in, some, in some places. Um, and in fact, what's interesting and difficult right now is the talks that are trying to get underway um, pertaining to Syria and also other places um, such as Afghanistan, often the, some of the first questions is who should be at the table. It's not a matter of that there isn't anybody. It's often that there's multiple parties and multiple different people associated with them. So how do you work out who the right people are at the table? How inclusive, how broad, how big the table should be? And then when do you start approaching these issues? I think the fact that these issues are not central right now in the discussions around Syria is not because anybody thinks they won't be addressed and that they won't be very, very important and difficult, but because there's these other issues that are actually first in terms of putting together what those talks should look like and who should be at the table. So I think the issues around accountability and how to deal with this extraordinary history that we've seen over the last years will be extremely difficult. It's not clear what the answers will be, but um, absolutely certain that they'll be, um, they'll be discussed um, in, in detail and, and with great difficulty. Perhaps I'll leave my comments there, and thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Right, thanks, Priscilla. Ambassador, please let me come back to you for uh, concluding remarks. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for a, for a really uh, terrific panel. Just, just a few 
concluding thoughts from me. I mean, the, the first is simply the incredible importance of this topic. When I talk to um, Syrian civil society representatives, the first thing they tell me is we want justice. If there is no justice, there is no future for this country. When I talk to my colleagues on the Security Council, the last thing they talk about is justice. And when you talk to them about justice, they say, oh, look, it's difficult enough as it is. So uh, go away with that. We'll deal with that. Like, certainly not today, probably also not tomorrow. And I think that's really wrong. I think that's conceptually wrong. And, you know, if you, you need to talk to the people who own the country. I mean, these are the people that have to live the peace and have to find the peace. If it's important to them, it has to be important to us. And I think we're making still that same mistake there. And this is why it's, for me, disappointing that next week, when we have the high-level meeting on sustaining peace, that this does not figure more prominently on the agenda. Because I really think it's part and parcel of this, this discussion. And not because we have good answers. I don't think we do. But we need to have that conversation. And I think the panel today shows that it's completely okay to have that conversation. It's nothing um, to be afraid of just because we cannot go in and say, oh, ask me a question, I have the answer, and then we go home. No, that's not how it is, but it's a conversation. It's a conversation to be, um, to be had. And, you know, one of the issues is you need to strike the balance because nobody says we don't want peace, obviously, and very few people say we don't need justice. So you need to strike the balance. So the question is who strikes that balance? And, you know... You may think it should be the Security Council of the United Nations. I don't think that's the answer. If you look at how the Council has uh, dealt with that um, in the past, institutionally, the Council could, could do it. But if you look at, at some of the situations that have been referenced here, if you look at Libya, for example, the Council took a very short-lived interest in the dimension of justice in Libya, and then it went away uh, at the expense of justice, at the expense, actually, of the ICC, and at the, at the expense of peace, eventually. So that's, that's not how it happens. So who does it? And I think what Priscilla said is very important that uh, the ICC, in particular, can certainly do more uh, in the areas that you have identified. Communication and strategy, timing, Extremely important, I agree, the court is doing rather poorly in those areas. That said, at the end of the day, it cannot be to the, up to the ICC, obviously, to strike that balance because it has only that one tool. And the other tool, the peace tool, is not really, is not really in the hands of the, of the ICC. So that's uh, one thing I think uh, that is very important for us to think about and also to not forget that justice can actually help bring peace during a conflict by isolating certain actors. Um, and we have seen that also in the past. Um, I very much liked also what uh, Professor Title said, that uh, the, the notion of justice is not a, is not a static uh, notion. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a broader concept that I think we, have, we agree has clear parameters, but there is certainly no one size fits all and I think this is also something that is important for, for the ICC that is, that is dear to us, as you know, um, because there is a, a risk that people have completely unrealistic expectations what this court can deliver. So if you take, okay, let's take Syria again, if the ICC was to have jurisdiction, and today there is no prospect for that, that doesn't mean it's impossible um, for all times, and then they put the number of people on trial, and let's say that's a dozen people, and maybe it's even the, the people that had the, have the most uh, responsibility um, for the crimes committed, that's still not enough for the country. You need a different kind of process in addition to bring the country um, back together and to have a real process of, of reckoning. So having trials in a court and in, a, in an international court in and of itself is not enough. And no matter what our notion of justice is, I think the goal should always be that it does actually contribute to that other goal, namely to have a, have a peace that is sustainable. So thanks a lot. Great panel. Thanks to uh, all of you. Thanks to IPI.
My thanks to the panel and, and to you, Ambassador, and, and to the government of Liechtenstein. And um, have a good afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>